Mary here, and I'm really proud to have this um, co-sponsored talk um, today here in the library. And I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Borgstrom, first of all, who's the uh, chairperson of the Department of English and Comparative Literature here at State, and they're co-sponsoring with the library this lecture. And if you haven't signed up on the, uh, the name sheet back there, please do so if you're with a class attending today. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sweaty. It's still hot outside, <laughs> trudging up that hill. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot. I'm, I'm mostly just going to give a few words about, about that guy over there. Um, but I will say I'm really delighted to introduce this talk today by my colleague and my very good friend, Joseph Thomas. Um, I'm especially delighted to hear him talk about Shel Silverstein, because in my mind, Joseph and Shel Silverstein kind of are intertwined. They go together. I've heard him talk to me individually, personally, a lot about Shel Silverstein over the years. And now all of you are lucky enough to get to hear some of his thoughts on Shel Silverstein as well. Um, Joseph said I should just say a very few brief words about Shell, and I keep thinking I can use the first name because he always does. <laughs> it's probably not cool, but I'll follow his lead. Um, most of you probably know his work from the series of children's books that you may have read when you were kids. Uh, I will say briefly that a few of my colleagues and I were just talking about Shel Silverstein, and I have only come around recently to like him as a kid, he scared me <laughs> a lot. And, and Joseph has kind of helped draw me out of that. But you probably know, like, uh, where the sidewalk ends. That was the one that scared me. The Giving Tree, which it's only moderately scared me. Um, but Joseph was reminding me that he was also, Shell was also an extremely prolific songwriter. He did lots of comics, um, had a kind of different career, as Joseph says, in writing for Playboy magazine, and also wrote many darkly comic short plays, which I think is the, to the focus of your talk today. Um, I'd rather say a few more words about, about Joseph Thomas, though, so a few more words about him, fewer words about Shell and more about Joseph. Um, Joseph is a specialist in 20th and 21st century American literature. Um, his specialty is kind of the avant-garde, the intersections between innovative writing for adults and children's poetry. He is also a poet, if you don't already know that, and he published a book of poems um, back in 2007. Is that right? Look, He's been shy and demure. <laughs> uh, the, the, the book of poems is called Strong Measures. He's also the director of the National Center for the Study of Children's Literature, which is housed in our department, and which he's run now for many years. He wrote the first book-length study of contemporary American children's poetry called Poetry's Playground. And he co-edited a book with Kenneth Kidd on prizing children's literature. Um, many, many essays that he's written about children's literature, about Hi Katie. Um, about experimental writing and about uh, American culture. Some personal information about Joseph, just to give you sort of the, the personal touch that he, he sanctioned this. He wrote to me this morning and said, you can say these things. <laughs> he is, quote, fond of cats. He's a Virgo. <laughs> oh God, this makes so much sense. <laughs> And he's also a tad anxious about his talk today, so I hope you'll ease that concern by giving him a warm welcome. All right, thank you. And thank you, Michael and Linda. And thank all of you for coming. Um, <clears throat> so, a long talk on Shel Silverstein's short plays. Um, Shel Silverstein's poems, for the most part, are intended for children. As children's texts, shepherded ably by his editor, Ursula Nordstrom, uh, they are largely mellowed versions of the kind of raucous, profane verse so commonly heard, performed <clears throat> on playgrounds to the jump rope's steady beat. Unlike his short plays and songs for adults, which treat adult subjects like sex and violence with both humor and candor, often involving coarse, vulgar language and explicit depictions of all manner of taboos, his children's poetry only skirts more adult content, especially when taken at face value, when removed from his larger conceptual continuity. Uh, like so much other popular poetry for children, 
His poems are predominantly, as Richard Flynn puts it, quote, amusing, light entertainments, mildly subversive regarding the adult world, mildly subversive regarding the adult world, yet ultimately didactic, a kind of cautionary verse light. Uh, Schell's poetry largely confirms our preconceptions about the innocence of children's writers, suggesting an author who might be a playful playground raconteur, but who in the end proves himself a Tom Sawyer-esque good bad boy. I could not answer to your question. <laughs> answer my question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice. Oh, I should, have, I should have said, please turn off your devices. <laughs> and then smash them with your boot <laughs> uh, Okay, so, um, but he, in the end, he proves himself a Tom Sawyer-esque good bad boy, uh, for beneath the precocious rule bending lies the didacticism mentioned by Richard Flynn. However, this innocence is but a fantasy of chastity, a chimera dispelled by Shell's persona and his songs and his cartoons, but especially his plays. And this is him at a nude beach. Um, uh, and especially his plays, which as we'll see are a particularly queer subset of Silverstein's oeuvre, both formally and thematically. A queering form while engaging in a queer critique of our dominant heterosexist institutions and ideologies. Furthermore, this critique and the play's formal experimentation are informed by Shell's popular identity as a children's writer, for they summon the trace of the child, even as they exclude actual children. Uh, the plays we're told again and again are for adults only, uh, and, and they, they embrace subject matter of a decidedly adult nature. Um, Shell's Plays arise from his roots in folk song and narrative poetry. In a June 4, 1990 review of Silverstein's short play Hamlet, starring Melvin Van Peebles, this guy, if you remember him, uh, Mel Gousseau, the reviewer, notes that like the devil in Billy Markham, which Gousseau reminds us was produced earlier that season at the Lincoln Center, uh, Hamlet is, quote, a monologue in verse a kind of street rap that imitates the rhythms of Robert Service and Clement Moore, end quote. Not all of Silverstein's short plays draw so heavily from the tradition of narrative poetry, but several do, the action unfolding via a sly narrator relating the events in past tense. The devil in Billy Markham, this is the devil, <coughs> for instance, has but one character. He's called Storyteller. Uh, the script opens with the stage directions scene. The storyteller enters. He wears a ratty top coat, baggy pants, unmatching vest, wrinkled shirt, and spotted necktie. He carries a mop and a bucket. He sets down the bucket and begins to mop the floor, humming to himself. He looks up, surprised to see the audience. He realizes his opportunity. He smiles. He begins to recite. These directions are absent in the January 1979 Playboy version of the piece. In Playboy, the verses are just that, lines of poetry. Instead of a short play, uh, the Playboy version is simply a narrative poem, illustrated evocatively by Brad Holland. And he did this illustration of the devil, which appears in the Playboy issue. <clears throat> in 2001, Playboy published a posthumous narrative poem by Silverstein called Topless Town, which begins it all started out at Rosalie's Good Eats Cafe. Everybody's sitting, eating eggs and grits, chatting in the usual way. Lucy pouring the coffee and dishing out the eats, wearing one of them flimsy, frilly white blouses with nothing underneath. This opening, and the rest of the poem's all about a town where everyone is topless. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool place. Um, <laughs> Uh, this opening is no more uh, dramatic than the opening to Hamlet as told on the street, as it was called in the January 1998 issue of Playboy, which was the last contribution to Playboy Shell would live to see. Uh, revised slightly for Playboy, Hamlet opens much like a folk song or perhaps a toast, uh, the first syllable an accented now, 
Now Francisco and Bernard Bernardo, they was guarding the castle, leaning on their spears, not looking for no hassle, having themselves a brew or two. When out in the night, they hear woo, and here comes this ghost looking ragged and rank in a rusty suit of armor going clank, clank, clank. In his review of the 1990 Van Peebles performance of this poem, Gusto writes, in Shel Silverstein's hipster Hamlet, Melvin Van Peebles rises from a front stoop and tells a loopy tale of royal Danish duplicity, replete with contemporary flourishes. The narrator rises from the stoop and tells us a story. Just as storyteller and the devil in Billy Markham interrupts, interrupts his janitorial work to weave us a tale. Just as the narrator of Topless Town, a poem I remind, not a play, uh, relays his unusual narrative. Again, the drama lies in the words and in the performance of those words, not in dramatized action. The connection between Shell's dramatic impulse and his musical slash poetic impulses is immediately apparent. Uh, one could easily transform the devil and Billy Markham into a folk song. And in 2012, his, uh, Shell's friend, uh, Bobby Baird, did this. He made a folk song version of it in his LP, Darker Than Light. Um, Hamlet could be a toast <coughs> or a rap with the help of a couple of turntables and a drum machine. Uh, and conversely, Topless Town might as well be a play. And in this case, all one would be are the words a short play beneath the title, and maybe an actor or a director, or if you're uh, feeling fancy, a set designer. <laughs> At first blush, Shell's plays may seem gen 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 generically uh, distinct from his conceptual continuity, but you can see they're actually not as far afield as one might think from either his poetry, so central to his aesthetic, or his songs, his poetry's twin. His plays tend to be more vulgar than his songs, which can be admittedly uh, fairly vulgar. If you listen to the title track of um, the 1972, Shell's 1972 album, Freakin' at the Freaker's Ball, uh, there's just a, a, a litany of weird uh, and delightful sexual kinks. Uh, or his song, I Love My Right Hand. <laughs> Guess what that one's about. Um, or Julie's Working, a character sketch of a young man unconcerned that his lover is a prostitute as long as she uh, brings home enough scratch to maintain his drug habit. Those are his songs, some of them. His plays participate in the exuberant language play that marks his best song lyrics and poems, yet the plays are largely but not entirely freed from his general predisposition for rhyme and accentual meter. Most of his plays, unlike The Devil and Billy Markham and Hamlet, are rendered in prose, not rhymed and metered verse. In this passage from Gone to Take a dot dot dot, for instance, Shell expounds virtuosically on the many idiomatic phrases employing the word shit, using repetition rather than rhyme and meter as its predominant poetic device. You're the shit. You're the shitter. Shitty and the shit. And I'm tired of taking your shit. You think you're such hot shit? Ha! Don't shit a shitter. You start slinging shit with me, I'll show you some shit. You'll wind up with the shitty end of the stick. You pull me up before some shit-faced labor relations board, I'll show them some shit. I'll prove what a useless piece of shit you are. I'll knock the shit out of you and your shit little shit-eating grin. You were shitting in tall cotton, now you're in the shit house. This was shit or get off the pot, and now you're shit out of luck. And so forth and so on. Uh, similarly, his play Bus Stop, uh, portrays an angry, a woman angry with a tipsy man. The stage directions read, <clears throat> he is a little drunk and very happy, for purposefully referring to the bus stop as a bust stop. So he's trying to be clever by commenting on her breasts. Uh, expecting a demure woman who will take this harassment without a fight, he is shocked by the verbal beatdown our heroine serves up. I stopped, you said bust stop, I got the bust, I stopped. I got the jugs, the boobies, the globes, the cans, the bust. The bust stops here. You want to touch? You want to lick? You want to put something between them? You want to put your little dicky between them? Your little pee pee? Your big prick? Your little Peter? Your pecker? Your cock? Your eel? Your prick? Your hot meat? 
your schlong, your schwanz, your salami, your banger, your wanker, your joystick, your ding-a-ling, your dong, your prick, your wing-ding doodle, your love muscle, your trouser snake, your red helmet warrior, your purple vein throbber, your tool, your unit, your shaft, your little Elvis, your meat sucker, your one-eyed monster, your third leg, your dangling doozy. And etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> she goes on for a while. Uh, while his children's poetry can be more than a, can more than occasionally um, venture into mildly subversive territory, <clears throat> um, it has an equal tendency uh, to be sentimental. So his songs, like uh, his songs, also can be sentimental, like "Cloudy Sky." I can't touch the sun in time. They're, they can be pretty cheesy. And, and his children's poetry has that tendency as well. Uh, but they, his songs still more commonly set up camp and reign in realms more taboo and sexually explicit, or at, least, or at the very least suggestive, while remaining more or less radio friendly. His plays, however, are uniformly humorous, rarely sentimental, and are, and perhaps even X rated in their content. Um, Shel Silverstein's children's poetry, songwriting, and short plays are also linked by their rough immediacy and um, folksy charm. Silverstein worked in the recording industry, writing songs and recording albums since at least 1959 when Electra released his first LP, Harry Jazz. As a working musician, Shel was no stranger to the stage performing live with the Red Onions, who backed him on this album here, and alongside Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show, who backed him on uh, Freakin' at the Freakers' Ball. An early scene in the movie, Who is Harry Kellerman and Why is He Saying Those Terrible Things About Me, from 1971. Um, an early scene in that film captures a part of a September 18th, excuse me, 1970 show at the Fillmore East, at which Shell and Dr. Hook open for the Grateful Dead. Uh, in real life, they did. And then they filmed it and put it in the, put it in the movie. Uh, during his time as songwriter for the band Dr. Hook, Shell would, would commonly accompany them on the road, occasionally joining them on stage for a few minutes, for a few numbers, rather. The film we're seeing from Who is Harry Kellerman is a sterling illustration of Shell's magnetic stage presence a dynamic theatricality necessary to, complicate for, uh, to compensate rather, for a voice that many people find abrasive, if not downright irritating. Have you guys ever heard him sing? He's got a <laughs> It's not very pretty, um, but he's all right. Likewise, in, a 1969, in 1969, Shell performed the unicorn, one of his children's poems, as a song on Playboy After Dark, and in April 1970, he, pre he performed A Boy Named Sue and Daddy What If on the Johnny Cash Show. So given his predilection for narrative poetry, song, and performance, Silverstein's turn to drama shouldn't surprise. However, more than simply an outgrowth of his interest in narrative and performance, his shift to playwriting emerged from a personal tragedy that soured him somewhat on children's literature, coupled with a growing distaste for the music business. Uh, first, let's take a look at Shell's Farewell to the Business, a goodbye that took the form of his 1980 country album, The Great Conk Train Robbery, his last major release as a singer-songwriter. And this is it. The bullet makes everything look pink, which I guess is cool, but this <laughs> is the greatest image of Shell Silverstein ever. Um, <clears throat> the title puns on his name, Conk being a kind of shell, um, Shell's old time, uh, old uh, friend, lifelong friend, he knew him since the time he was a little boy, uh, Marv Gold, quotes Silverstein's musings on his abiding, intimate relationship with country music. Silverstein says, I've been into country all my life. I was always listening to country and western stations when I was growing up. It's apt then that Silverstein ended his bittersweet tenure in the music business with a country album. The album contains many of the light, humorous cuts for which he became <coughs> famous, at least among singers and uh, uh, songwriters and performers. But it's the tune Rough on the Living that is relevant to our discussion, as it speaks directly, bless you, uh, albeit through a thinly veiled persona, to the disenchantment Silverstein felt about the music industry. First recorded in 1979 by Bobby Bear for his album Down and Dirty, 
Shell's song was inspired by Nashville's, lim Nashville's lamentable treatment of bluegrass guitarist uh, Lester Flatt, who died that same year in 1979. A prolific songwriter and legendary guitarist, Flatt got his start in 1945 when he joined, uh, joined Bill Monroe's bluegrass band, writing and recording and performing for decades with seminal bluegrass groups like Flatt and Scruggs and the Foggy Mountain Boys and Nashville Grass. However, much as the Nashville establishment would turn its back on Shell's collaborator, Johnny Cash, Flatt was denied the level of recognition Silverstein and other Nashville singer-songwriters believed he deserved, garnering it only after his death. The lyrics of this song uh, concern a hard luck songwriter who has recently died, painting a picture of a Nashville that chews up and spits out talent, recognizing their contributions only posthumously. Oddly prescient, uh, Silverstein wouldn't be inducted into the, into the National Hall of, uh, Songwriter Hall of Fame until 2002, uh, three years after his death. The song ends, they observe 20 seconds of silence at the Opry on Saturday night, and they're searching the bars and the basements for some souvenir of his life. They're planning the book for September, showing his plain country roots, and they're selling the rights to the movie and the Hall of Fame's getting his boots. At the funeral, somebody recited a poem that told how he suffered and bled. Nashville's rough on the living, but she really speaks well of the dead. Shell's interest in playwriting, which quickly became his primary artistic outlet in the 80s, uh, was intensified by this distaste for the music business and his coincident turn from children's literature, a turn inspired, again, uh, by a deep personal loss. The tragedy that drove Silverstein from children's literature struck in 1982, just a handful of years after Silverstein began writing plays and only two years after the release of the great conch train robbery. Shell's first child, Shoshana, died age 11 unexpectedly and tragically from a brain aneurysm while living with her grandparents in Baltimore. Shell was, um, Shell, as we'll see in a moment, distrusted the traditional nuclear family. And although he was fond of Shoshana and her death uh, devastated him, she never lived with, uh, with her father. Silverstein's friend, Lynn McAlford, notes that the theater work with which Shell busied himself during the, 1980, during the early 80s got him through, quote, a very dark period in his life. This dark period saw Silverstein turn from his children's work completely. Uh, the sole exception to this turn is 1985 recording of Where the Sidewalk Ends, a, a, a project that I think emerges from his love of performance rather than his interest in music or children's literature. A Light in the Attic in 1981, which he dedicated to Shoshana, which this was when she was still alive, uh, to Shana, it says at the front of the book, was the last children's book he would write for 15 years. The only other children's book released during that period was this uh, re-release of Who Wants a Chief Rhinoceros, which was, re which was originally published in 64. But that re-release re was already in the works um, when Shoshana died. And he dedicated that edition to um, Shoshana's aunt and uncle, Curtis and Meg, who uh, she lived with after her mother died um, when she was a baby. She had a hard life, that little girl. Uh, the Marshalls had taken in and raised Shoshana after the untimely death of her mother, Susan Hastings, in 1975, when she was only five years old. Uh, Shoshana's death intensified Shell's predisposition against marriage and conventional long-term monogamous relationships. Silverstein never married and never, in fact, uh, cohabitated long-term with anyone of either gender, um, or any gender, let's say. Uh, his second child, Matthew, was born in 1983, and he would dedicate his next children's book, 1996's Falling Up, to Matthew's mother, Sarah Spencer, in a dedication that, sim that read simply to Sarah. Silverstein's, Silverstein's plays, like many of his cartoons for adults, treat marriage and the conventional gender roles they imply with razor-edge satire. Although his skepticism about, about traditional romantic pairings is evident even in his work for children. 
In Shell's plays, similar themes are picked up, although the satire is acidic. Consider, if you will, his innocuously titled The Lifeboat is Sinking, which concerns a husband, Sherwin, and his wife, Jen, role-playing in the bedroom. However, their role-playing is not of the sexual variety, but rather involves an absurd scenario that serves as a bleakly pessimistic metaphor for the unhealthier jealousies that sustain and corrode the family unit. The play plays with the multiple competing identities thrust upon those who participate in heterosexual marriage, an institution Shell consistently writes as lamentably sexist and patriarchal, even as he stresses that, the, that this sexist institution affects both genders negatively. The scene focuses mostly on the pressures conventional patriarchal marriage places on the husband, Sherwin's duties as a husband, a father, and a son are in conflict and therefore present him with a psychological crisis, uh, one foregrounded and intensified by his admittedly shrewish <coughs> wife, uh, the author of the troubling scenario. Uh, Jin's unlikable character is, the play suggests, a direct result of the institution in which she participates. As in his children's book, The Missing Piece, and The Missing Piece, meets the big O, the implication is, again, that both men and women would be better off refusing to participate in marriage, that the institution itself is what hails them, as Louis Althusser might put it, into these roles. Sherwin, the conflicted pater familias, and torn between his duty as a father, husband, and a son, and Jen, the shrewd harridan, exerting her power as a kind of bedroom trickster. Similar family dramas are articulated in Shell's cartoons. Take, for instance, Supporting the Family, which is in his collection, Different Dances, which features a man and his family dressed like circus performers as they're all performing the roles assigned to them by, their, by our culture. Uh, the, light, the father literally supports an ever-growing family. Uh, kids, pets, uh, grandparents all pile on his shoulders until the weight um, that, that comes with his role, weight compounded by the consumer society in which we live, the television, you'll see, is um, among the family members piled on his shoulders, uh, crushes him into the ground, the ball of <coughs> on his head, just barely peeking out from the earth, is all that's uh, visible of the father by the cartoon's end. This is the, the father smashed into the ground. <coughs> or, uh, for another obvious example, there's the split also in different dances, a wordless strip which depicts a cartoon child being cruel, cruelly torn in half by two adults, perhaps after a difficult divorce. The child's welfare uh, less important than each parent's pride. Uh, no Sol Solomon adjudicates this dispute, wisdom supplanted by self-interest, uh, supplanted by self-interest. Another reading of this comic might suggest that the eponymous split is into divorce but rather a metaphor for the way parents sometimes use children as pawns in more petty and quotidian ways. The child less an actual human with needs, interests of his or her own, and more a mechanism by which uh, parents can work through the long-standing resentments and irritations that emerge in long-term and monogamous relationships. So get ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the life, lifeboat is sinking, dramatizes related uh, marital tensions. Jen and Sherwin pretend, again at Jen's insistence, that they are on the lifeboat, the marriage bed, that is rapidly sinking. The father, the mother, their daughter, and the father's mom are all in immediate peril. And the scenario, the only way they can, they can survive is if the father chooses to throw one of the three overboard. Adopting the voice of the child, Jen pleads, Help me, Daddy. I'm afraid. Choose, Daddy, please. Make the decision. Choose wife, daughter, or mother. Of course, Jen specifies that Sherwin can't choose to kill himself because, as in supporting the family, uh, she, sa she says, the, fa the father is needed to navigate. You're the only one strong enough to throw one of us overboard. Why do I have to choose, he says. These are your people. We are all yours. Your wife. Your daughter, your mother, we're all tied together through you. You, you have to choose. Now, now before we're all dead and drowned and just sightless, 
lifeless, bloated corpses floating to the bottom of the cruel and stormy sea. Choose. This is like some nice bedroom games to play. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the bedroom on the bed playing this scenario. <laughs> uh, okay, after much wrangling, he, he makes the right choice, which is to throw his mother overboard. <laughs> um, <laughs> but after he does, uh, the wife notes again that the boat's sinking. And now he has to choose between his wife and his daughter. Okay, so this is kind of a hilarious dramatization of what Freud would call the fem feminine Oedipus attitude, or uh, more famously, Carl Jung's Electra complex. Uh, the play <laughs> offers us an image of the nuclear family rife with jealousy, shot through with anxiety, and structured by, an ever <laughs> by ever shifting hierarchies and Machiavellian power plays. And there are others, many others, that engage plays that engage in the constellation of issues surrounding gender heteronormativity and the nuclear family, such as one tennis shoe, uh, which, in which a good housewife is slapped by her husband in order to keep her from coming a bad, becoming a bad lady. Uh, she has a tendency to play reveals to pick through the garbage and fill her purse with seemingly random objects that catch her eye. Uh, the implication, however, is that she would be better off as a bad lady than a wife. Sylvia employ, implores, if I start weaving that crazy stuff in my hair, you've got to stop me, slap me. I, I could never, you've got to, you must, try it, do it now, slap me. You've got to be forceful, Harvey. They have no homes, they prowl the streets, they don't get their hair done, they don't have to bathe, they don't have to shave their legs, they don't worry about it, no cooking to do, no house to clean, no man to consider. They scream out, hey buster, watch your fender, you son of a bitch, watch out, you creep, fuck you, pomp is self-righteous, and then he slaps her. At which point, um, you know, he slaps her. And his slap, I argue, is no less abusive, Shell implies, than the culture that works to impress women into the ranks of housewives. Harry's saving slap then becomes a metaphor <clears throat> for this cultural work violently reinscribing her into her bourgeois role, knocking out of her even the idea that there are other ways to live. Oh, and these are some stories about uh, Silverstein as a homeless man. Uh, it might bear, well, so read those or listen to me. Uh, <laughs> it might bear mentioning that Silverstein himself was often mistaken for a homeless man, as wealthy as he was. Uh, once in a Key West bookstore, uh, once a Key West bookstore clerk refused to let Shell use his credit card to pr purchase books. The next day, Shell received a call from his credit card company, for the bookstore owner reported that a homeless man had tried to use one of his Silverstein's <laughs> credit cards. Uh, which is to say, as a man without roots, want to move from place to place, city to city, to look ex askance at high fashion and conventional grooming. Uh, Shell was not one to code negatively the life and look of the bag lady or the homeless drifter as a type. He was, he's on the side of the, of the bag lady, not this mean cop, in other <laughs> words. Uh, before continuing, I should pause to note that like many of the genres and modes of production Silverstein employed, light verse, cartooning, the children's picture book, popular song, uh, the short play, ha as, an, as an artistic form, has also gotten the short shrift. Unlike long-form theater, the short play is often looked down upon as a trifle, and as a result has been critically neglected. In one of the few major articles scrutinizing the form, uh, Rick Mitchell's Simple Pleasures, the 10-minute play, Overnight Theater, and the Decline of the Art of Storytelling, uh, Mitchell notes that the 10-minute phenomenon was initially sparked by the introduction of the forum in 1977 by Actors Theatre of Louisville and was then spurred on by numerous 10-minute play competitions. This is the same period that Silverstein began to tour <coughs> plays, sparked by his friendships with writer and artist uh, Larry Moyer and playwright and screenwriter David Mamet. Um, whom he met a year after Shoshana died. This is Mamet. Uh, Mamet, in particular, was the proponent of the short form play, suggesting that it could cut to the bone saggy, longer works. Mitchell maintains that the short form play 
uh, may be a symptom of the mass media's tendency to reduce the world's conflicts, quote, to corporate-friendly mini-narratives, biased sound and image bites stripped of historical context. Reminding us of Walter Benjamin's essay, The Storyteller, wherein ben Benjamin argues that in Mitchell's words, quote, the middle class press is responsible for a waning ability to weave intricate stories. Information is the problem for, to quote Benjamin, quote, prime, its prime requirement is that it appear understandable in itself. It is indispensable for information to sound plausible. Because of this, it proves incom incompatible with storytelling information. Uh, if, if, story, if the art of storytelling has become rare, the dissemination of information has had a decisive share in that state of affairs. That's Benjamin. Despite this buzz harshing start, however, we find that Mitchell is actually a proponent of the form, noting that, quote, although the 10 minute play, while symptomatic of the information age, may also, ironically, possess the potential to resist the sort of plausible information that has been so detrimental to our ability to communicate, end quote. To il illustrate the short play's potential to resist our contemporary privileging of the dissemination of information over storytelling's other uses, Mitchell turns to Italian futurist F.T. Marionetti's endorsement of variety theater, which featured short form drama as an antidote to contemporary theater, which for Marionetti vacillates stupidly between historical reconstruction pastiche or plagiarism, and photographic reproduction of our daily life, a finicking, slow, analytic, and diluted theater worthy, all in all, of the age of the oil lamp." End quote. That's Marionetti. A variety theater for Marionetti generates the futurist marvelous, whose elements he outlines thusly. Powerful caricatures, abysses of the ridiculous, delicious, impalpable ironies, the whole gamut of laughter and smiles to flex the nerves, the whole gamut of stupidity, imbecility, doltishness and absurdity, insensibility pushing the intelligence to the very border of madness, a cumulus, a cumulus of events unfolded at great speed of stage characters pushed from right to left in two minutes." End quote. Uh, in a chapter on urchin poetry in my book, Poetry's Playground, I note that Silverstein's poetry for children avoids obscurity and avant-garde experimentation. Yet if it's, this is true of his children's work, it is certainly not in regard to his short plays, which suggest, like much of his adult work, Dadaized impulses, Dionysian experiments, and radical ambiguities that resist easy interpretation. Uh, for example, he's got a short play called, um, uh, called uh, thinking up a new name for the act. And in that play, there's four acts, and the characters can only speak the three words, meat, and, and potatoes. <laughs> and it's a four act play, that's the only thing they can say. And they actually communicate. It's a pretty, pretty good little play. Um, <coughs> so he pushes the boundaries of, of, of uh, drama in ways I think Barry Nettie would approve of. In many ways, his short plays embody the futurist marvelous outlined by Marinetti. They are ridiculous caricatures of shadowy irony, quick, absurdist portraits that rather than serving as information, serve as informants, ratting out the incongruities and illogic of bourgeois ideology. And there is something disturbingly marvelous about Shell's plays, plumbing as they do the absurd realities of contemporary American life. They're the closest Shell comes to the surreal, uh, to surreal dark comedy. Hardly realistic, Shell's plays depict, as Marinetti puts it, the whole gamut of stupidity, imbecility, doltishness, and absurdity of mainstream American values, reflecting those values in the proverbial glass darkly. The glass, in this case, the carnival mirror of black comedy. The lifeboat is sinking, like so many of his plays, <coughs> recalls the surreal impulses of 70s and 80s prose poetry gesturing towards unsettling truths by way of Marinetti's powerful caricatures, by plumbing abysses <coughs> of the ridiculous, by suggesting delicious, impalpable ironies. For instance, Shell's short play, short play Dreamers features two plumbers, Richie and Nick, 
debating the significance of dreams, a comedy sketch scenario that affords Silverstein the opportunity to articulate a range of issues hovering around the heterosexual nuclear family as an apparatus perpetuating um, the heterosexist patriarchal ideology so central to our culture. The play's conflict centers on a homoerotic dream of Richie's, a dream he is hesitant to discuss as he fears it, it suggests that he's a faggot. Nick counters that dreams are all symbolic and according to Shell's stage, stage directions, unzips his fly and takes out his dick. Whereupon he says, matter of factly, here, take a look at this. What the hell are you doing, Nick? I'm showing you my dick. If you're a faggot, you're gonna wanna grab it or suck it. Do you wanna grab it or suck it? No, for God's sake. Okay, now feel your own dick. See if I gave you a heart on. Of course, it doesn't. And Nick uses this as evidence that Richie is not indeed a faggot. Uh, part of the dark humor, of course, here lies in Nick's ridiculously reductive understanding of gay desire and arousal. He has no idea what he's talking about. Um, this exchange is troubling and not particularly funny, although it does flex the nerves, as Marinetti puts it. In performances I've seen, the audience at this point laughs uncertainly, nervously. The scene seems like it wants to be funny, has all the rhythms and markers of comedy, but the homophobia on display, represented but not endorsed, troubles more than it delights, at least in Los Angeles where I've seen it. But Shell does not stop there, pushing onward, downward, <coughs> having Nick explain, seriously, you let th those things fester inside your mind, they can grow like a cancer. The next thing you know, you are a faggot. Jesus, just because you dream something doesn't mean that you want to do it, for God's sakes. For God's sake. You know what I dreamt about last week? You know what I dreamt about? I dreamt about fucking my daughter, my own daughter. Karen? Francie, the younger one? What if it was the older one? It was a dream. You think I want to fuck my own daughter? Even the older one? I'd kill anyone who fucked my daughter. It was symbolic. Of what? How the hell do I know? So this is the, this is the kind of stuff you get. He, he begins to scrape out rust, and Richie mixes plaster and places tiles while Nick examines the medicine cabinet. This conversation, underscored by their labor, uh, leads to Nick's revelation that he's dreamed of fucking his own mother. I dreamt of fucking my mother, my own mother. She's always sitting on the back porch, and it's late at night, and I'm a kid, and I come home, and we do it right there on the porch. And she always says, quiet, or you'll wake up your father. You think I would have fucked my own mother? <laughs> uh, and this is how it is with Silverstein's short plays. I like how tender that is. It's actually kind of sweet. She's like, shh. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> he just wants to fuck his mother. <laughs> Who has Who doesn't? Um, who hasn't fucked their own mother? <laughs> okay. We should stop. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay. Then uh, there's another play, Abandon All Hope, which involves two men debating whether they should enter Dante's famous portal to hell. Uh, and it ends evoking the economic and familial roots of racism. So this is going to be some more troubling stuff, gang. So brace yourself. Um, Al, a good working class white name, wonders skeptically just how bad it can be on the other side of the gate. What's the worst thing that can happen? Attacks by man-eating rats? Ass-fucking Koreans? This last bit troubles his friend Benny, who inquires after the Koreans come up a few more times. Uh, you keep bringing it up. You want Koreans to fuck you in the ass? Okay, who's saying don't do it? Go down to Broom Street and meet some Korean and tell him to fuck you in the ass. I just want to know, these Koreans, are they the actual Korea are they actual Koreans wanting to actually fuck you in your actual ass? Or are they the Koreans of the city, the fruit store owners, the cleaning store owners, the grocery store owners, the successful merchants getting rich while your grocery went out of business? Koreans whose children are getting higher SAT ratings than your children, getting the scholarships, getting the medical school acceptance, law school, dental school. Are these the ones that keep fucking you in the ass? Al's racism emerges from his economic worries, yes, but those worries are in turn situated squarely at the family's dinner table. Al is supposed to be a man, a provider, his self-worth equivalent 
to the success of the nuclear family of which he's the patriarch. He's supposed to do the fucking. At the national and the family level, white men are the tops, not the bottoms. However, larger socioeconomic and demographic changes beyond his control and understanding, beyond his ability to master, have, you know, these are, these are the changes uh, that, that we're talking about here. He can't control, he can't master. And so his anxiety about his children's future and cultural changes that uh, threaten his own wife, his own white privilege, strain to the breaking point his self-conception as a strong white father. These more difficult to grasp realities rendered simply in the image of his emasculation, the white man of the house being fucked in the ass by some kind of vague sketch of a barely understood and queer Korean. Not actual Korean Americans, gay or otherwise, the Koreans of the city, the food store, fruit store owners, the cleaning store owners, the grocery store owners, the successful merchants, but instead an abstract, orientalized racial other. Here's a play as relevant today as it was in the 80s, what with the rise of the Tea Party, the men's rights movement, and the pol political success of Donald Trump, among other barely disguised symptoms of a perceived decline in white male privilege. What lies beyond that gate? For Al, it's a hellish America, not unlike the one described by President Trump in his 2017 inaugural address. An America, an America in which mothers, and these are his words, mothers and children are trapped in poverty. I'm not going to do a Trump impression. <laughs> trapped in poverty in our in, in inner cities, where rusted out factories are scattered like tombstones across the landscape of our nation. An America where crime and gangs and drugs have stolen too many lives and robbed our country of so much unrealized potential. An America vastly different from the one idealized in mid-century American media, but one not too different from the racist Chicago in which Silverstein became a man, a city where potential landlords would often turn him away because of his Jewish background. He wasn't the kind of tenant they were looking for. And that is, an America not very different from the one of today, and thus these plays continue relevance. As you can see, some of Shell's plays initially appear sexist or homophobic or xenophobic or racist, but taken together, and he's written scores of them, they possess a charming and sometimes outdated bohemian resistance to bourgeois institutions, particularly, those in the, particularly the institution of family in his co-committed ideology of futurity as embodied in the image of the child, an image that Lee Edelman reminds, uh, enacts a logic of repetition that fixes identity through identification with the future of the social order. Now, Edelman insists that this image should not be confused with the lived experiences of any historical children, like Shell's own children, Shoshana and Matthew. Edelman writes of a symbolic child that in its coercive universalization serves to regulate political discourse, to prescribe what will count as discourse by compelling such discourse to accede in advance to the, to the reality of a collective future whose figurative status we are never permitted to acknowledge or address. A future predicated on heteronormativity, marriage, the politics of reproduction and the sacralization of the child that thus necessitates the sacrifice of the queer. And the queer, the odd, the counter, and the abject is always at center, at the center of Shell's adult work, if a center there can be. Al's homophobic racism emerges from his anxiety about ch his children's future, just as Nick's masculine identity is informed by a queer desire for his daughters and an equal and opposite desire to maintain her virginal status as a child. I'll ki I'd kill anybody who fucked my own daughter, he proclaims after describing his dream about fucking his daughter. The family is an institution and the roles of the members in the family are buoyed by this impossible and contradictory imagined child. A child that threatens gin and the lifeboat is sinking as her role as mother is, according to the logic of the nuclear family, subservient to the needs of her child, 
just as the father, Sherwin, must jettison his mother in favor of his wife, who in turn has produced a child whose future outweighs her present. Or rather, the parent's present exists only to ensure their daughter's future. The play ends, you'll recall, with Jen posing the unanswered question, who will Sherwin choose to murder this time, wife or daughter? Our Uncle Shelby then seems to fa favor a child unmoored from the family, favors the freak, the queer, the unsettled and unsettling. His child is like the freakish kid summoned by Leslie Fiedler in Freaks, um, Myths and Images of the Secret Self. The freak who, when compared to an adult, is himself a midget, while when compared to a baby or his last year self, he is a giant. In his deep consciousness, Fiedler writes, he is forever growing bigger and smaller. I think that'll do. And bigger and smaller, depending on the context and the eye in which he sees himself reflected. With their focus on the carnivalesque and scatological and unkempt and strange and abject, qualities associated uncomfortably, sometimes unconsciously, with childhood, Uncle Shelby's plays root themselves in the child even as the scripts and performances are marked for adults only. The title of an adult evening of Shel Silverstein, for instance, is laced with the trace of the excluded child. The advertisements for his productions, um, for productions of Shell's plays insist that they're for adults only. And these traces of the child are not, in Shelby's case, the symbolic child suggested by Edelman, above or earlier, but rather, again, are Fiedler's plural and polymorphous perverse child freaks. Those children we, want, we all once were, children born unhousebroken and half wild, dabbling in their own feces and popping into their mouths whatever unlikely object they can grab. Those children who remain for a long time unsure whether they are, the, are beasts or men, little animals more like their pets than their parents. Uncle Shelby's plays offer up alterity in the form of radical familiarization. Ad audiences head out for an adult evening of Shel Silverstein, expecting something akin to his children's poetry, when cordoned off from the Uncle Shelby persona and his conceptual continuity. That is, audiences expect marginally subversive texts with a hint of optimis optimistic didacticism with a note of sentimentality. Instead, however, they're met by an Uncle Shelby with whom they're unfamiliar, an authoring persona holding up a mirror to American life and its too often uncritically accepted institutions. The themes suggested by his children's work developed and exaggerated. Audiences are greeted by an unfiltered critique of the nuclear family, by representations of twisted and nightmarishly funny consumer interactions in the form of um, wash and dry, uh, for instance. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, that's a play that involves a crooked, literal-minded laundromat owner who advises his frustrated customer, don't expect too much of life. You'll be sorely disillusioned. You're talking to someone who knows. Don't expect a better roses. Uh, they're greeted by, a war by warped workplace dramas like that found in Gone to Take a Dot, 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 which I gestured to earlier. Uh, they're greeted by an un uncanny domestic dramas, as in The Best Daddy, <coughs> featuring a father who buys his daughter a dead pony for her birthday. <laughs> Better than no pony. <laughs> <laughs> or The Lifeboat is Sinking, which we discussed a moment ago. His plays are as sexist and homophobic and xenophobic and racist as the society in which they are produced, the society in which we live. And their critique of our society is all the more incisive coming from dear old Uncle Shelby, the benevolent storyteller so many of today's adults look back on with nostalgic affection. And that's it. Woo!